Hi, and welcome to Hope Chapel of Greenville, a church based upon four pillars, preaching the authority of God's Word without apology, lifting high the name of Jesus through worship, believing firmly in the power of prayer, and sharing the good news of Jesus with boldness. We hope that today's message is a point of spiritual growth for your life. And now, here is Pastor Will with today's message. If you ever come over to visit in my house and you come into my study, you'll find a, a great love that I have in my life is church history. I love to read about church history. I love to see how God has promised and fulfilled that he is going to build his church. To read and understand that is to see for me just great and sheer delight. And there are many lessons that you can learn and that I have learned throughout the years from church history. There are many lessons that teach us, but one of the crucial and most important ones is one that we're going to look at this morning, and that's simply this. Ministry is messy. Ministry is messy. Um, your life is a mess. My life is a mess. You know, that's true. Every single day, we wake up trying to say, okay, let's see if we can't clean it up a little bit better, all right? And sometimes we have friends that look at us and you know what's in their eyes. They're saying, your life is a mess. Brothers and sisters, that's part of the Christian life. It comes from the theological understanding of redemption. God is in the business of redeeming your life. He didn't save you in a moment so that everything could be perfect. He saved you so that you could progress to become more and more like Jesus Christ. So you're here this morning and when I made the statement, your life is a mess, some of you probably responded with, you don't have a clue of how messy my life is, all right? Some of you probably responded with, who are you to tell me about my life being messy, okay? We're all in the same business, folks, all right? We're all there. Church history gives to us an encouragement, and this passage of Scripture deals specifically with the fact that when you seek to minister, you have to get messy, a friend of mine told me uh, many years ago, he said, just get this early on in your ministry, Will. Christianity is a messy place to be, all right? So if you come, I knew one, one individual that had in his church, he said, if you're perfect, please don't attend, okay? And that's true because all of us are working with something. Isn't that true? Every single person is working in something in their life before God, because it's not as you want it to be, it's not as God wants it to be. Luke takes us in this passage of Scripture, which is, is a difficult passage of Scripture, because it's kind of just bringing together four different situations. Now, we'll learn in this that Paul was in Ephesus for over close to three years. And out of three years, chapter 19, we just read a portion of it, chapter 19 talks about those three years. And, and Luke just kind of pulls four incidences, four events out of it and says, okay, I'm gonna put this in, in, in this book of, that I'm calling the Acts of the Apostle. So he teaches us about the message of the church. And what I delight in is that he's honest about that. Have you ever, have you ever had friends that seemingly don't see anything that's wrong? I mean, everything is okay. Everything is good. And they just don't see the messes. They're the type that walk out to a pasture, a horse pasture, a cow pasture, and just don't see any of the cow dung that's out there. Okay? Dan is telling us that that's him. All right? All right? But they walk out in those pastures. <laughs> they walk out in... <laughs> okay, we got an ant on that one. All right? But we, they walk out in those pastures and they can walk from cow pie to cow pie to cow pie to cow pie. And it's like everything's great out here. Isn't it wonderful? All the fertilizer that's all around. Okay. There are people that are like that. But Christianity is messy. And Luke, when he wants to describe the, the three years that Paul was in Ephesus, gave us four stories about messes. Because we didn't read, if you can look at verses 21 to 40, 40, uh, 41, we didn't read any about that, and that was a mess too. And that's about the riot that happened in Ephesus that caused Paul to say, I'm out of here. In the next chapter, chapter 20, Paul leaves Ephesus. Why? Because of those verses. So here you're Luke, you're Luke, and you're writing a history of the church. And you think in your mind, okay, I want to write about what Paul did in Ephesus. 
Interesting. He pull, pulls out four messages. Now, what would you do? Alan, if you were, if you were writing about something that occurred in for, for three years, would you tend to write the good or the bad? The good. The good okay. Mark, what would you write about? <coughs> Beth? James? Everybody would say? There is no bad in James' life, all right? Okay. He is one blessed, optimistic individual. When I'm discouraged, guess who I'm calling? James, all right? Luke writes about four events that are messes. Why? I asked that, myself that question this week. Why does, why does James, because it's in the messes that you see Jesus. Amen? It's in the tough part of your life where you see Christ. Because when things are really going well, what do we tend to do? In our humanness, we stop seeking the, the uh, help of God. Everything's good. Everything's wonderful. This passage, as it de deals in these four sections or occurrences or events, connected simply in the fact that they all happen in the book of Ephesus. And each show a chapter in the life of this great, great church. Ephesus was a big town. Let me tell you a little bit about Ephesus so you know where we're coming from. Ephesus was a big town back in that time. It was the capital of the Roman, what we would call Roman Asia at that time. And it was known for its temple of Artemis or Diana. Take your pick. One of the seven wonders of the world. It was the largest building of its kind back in that time. And its theater that was in Ephesus held over 50,000 individuals. Paul fought with the beasts in this theater, in this uh, arena. He says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 32, it was a harbor city. And for a time, it was the port between the east and the west in a connection. And a great many Jews lived there and Christians were now coming there. Paul first contacted Ephesus on his way home from Antioch on the second missionary journey. And he left the couple that we talked about before, Aquila and Priscilla, he left them there to help start the church and continue with the church. But on his third mission journey, missionary journey, where we are at right now, he comes and he stays close to three years, the longest of any stay that he's ever had at any church. And from this church, he wrote 1 Corinthians and the book of Galatians. He was the founding pastor and the great titans of the faith followed him there. Tim Timothy, his uh, disciple, came here to be pastor. Also, Tychicus was the pastor here. You remember John, the beloved disciple? He came to pastor here also at Ephesus. So Ephesus, back in this time, became a phenomenal church. It was a very well-known church. It was one of the seven churches, if you'll take your Bible and turn, if you would like, to, Rome, uh, to Revelation chapter 2, you'll find that it is one of the seven churches of the book of Revelation that, Paul, that uh, John deals with. And this, this church was the one that later on lost its first love and the Lord shut it down and the light there. So you can read, but it was the first church mentioned in the book of Revelation. They, lo they lost their first love in chapter 2 and verse 4 of Revelation. Now let me just pause here, ask your eyeballs up here, and let me say this to you. If you have chosen by God's design in your life, if you've chosen that, great, uh, that, that Hope uh, Chapel is your church, then you've come to a place that's messy. Okay? If you didn't know that, because we tend to, as Christians, come on Sunday and make everything kind of look good, right? We kind of dress the best we can and we put on the best smile, right? But you've come to a place, and I just want you to know this, you've come to a place that gets messy, okay? You've come to a place where we deal with the messy, messy part of life. We don't put on a show here. On Sunday, we'll greet and love, but if there's a problem, we've got to deal with it, all right? Why? because that's what God has for us. So there are messes in my life that God deals with and the men around me talk to me about, and there's messes that are in your life. That's part of God's redemptive idea. Ministry, get this, ministry is messy. We're starting a men's ministry. It's gonna be messy business, okay? Uh, there's gonna be disagreements, can you believe that? There's going to be disagreements. If there's two people in the room, there's usually a disagreement, all right? 
We've got seven guys in the room and we're all talking and we're all coming to some conclusions and asking questions, all right? It's going to get messy, all right? That's okay. That's part of the Christian experience. What is not okay is when you have messes and you don't want to deal with them. So let me encourage you, kids, deal with the messes in your life young on, all right? Get used to that. Don't be afraid of messes, all right? What happens with you're eating with somebody and they have crumb? Have you ever done that? They have crumb on their face? All right, and they don't know it, and they keep talking. What are you usually doing? You're staring at that little piece of crumb that's on the face, and what do you kind of want to do? It depends on if you know them well enough. If you don't know them well enough, you just stare at it the whole time, right? <laughs> but if you know them well enough, what do you do? You, you reach over, and you, you got something on your cheek there. Oh, excuse me, and they pick up the, they take it off, and, all right, and everybody laughs, and that's okay. That's what we do here. We're not the types that just look at it. Okay, we're the type that are going to say, I love you very much, but you got a crumb on your face. All right? All right? Why? Because ministry is messy. And I want to tell you this, to, to open your heart to this, every single person in this room has a mess in their life. I don't know what it is. I don't know all of them, but it's messy. That's okay. Why? When we get to heaven, what? No more mess. All right? All the beds are going to be made in heaven. All right? I was reading this last week and reminding when I was trying to teach my boys about cleaning their beds. They referred to a passage of Scripture that I just read again, this, this Psalm 139. And it said, And if I make my bed in hell, you are there. <laughs> and I said, That's hell. He said, Dad, I have to make my bed there. I said, You go to heaven, you don't have to make your bed at all. It just makes itself, all right? Every place that you go to from this day forward is going to involve itself in your life in some type of mess. The great stallions of the faith, the great men of the faith, the, the great people who have walked the line with Christ are people who are saying, I will, I will admit I have a mess and I'm going to deal with it. Okay? The ones who walk away from the faith or the ones who don't really extend the kingdom of God or people who say, I, I don't want to even admit I have a mess in my life and they try to hide it. And let me tell you, beloved, the South is well known for hiding messes. Okay? That's just the way we are in our culture down here. We kind of just want to make like everything is okay. All right? Up in the North, you go there, they may not, they, you may be in line and, and a, a total stranger will walk over to you and say, you got a crumb on your face, all right? And you look at, oh, okay, thanks. You got a couple too, but you're all right. But that's the north. Down here in the south, you can live for 40 years with a crumb on your face, all right? It's just the way we are, we tend to be. And that's gracious and there's, there's nice things about that. But I want you to know, if you're gonna get involved in ministry, Whatever it is, in the children's ministry, in the nurse ministry, in the life groups that just started this last week, it's going to be messy. And you need to know this, that's okay. What's not okay is if we don't deal with the messy, all right? So know this, Hope Chapel is going to be a place where we deal with the messy. If there's a problem, we're going to look at it and we're going to talk about it. We're going to deal with it. We have to. That's who we are. That's how we've slated the church to be, all right? So we're going to have four things we're going to look at today. There are four aspects of messy in this chapter. The first one I want you to look at is the mess of bad theology. The mess of bad theology. Let's begin reading again in verse 2. And he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Now let me ask you a question. You guys give me theological feedback. Can you be a Christian without having the Holy Spirit within you? No. So if you're a Christian here this morning, if you know God, Holy Spirit resides within you, correct? Mm -hmm. Is there any other way that that can happen? No. You have to have the Holy Spirit. So if they don't have the Holy Spirit residing within them, they are people who profess that they know God, but who truly what? They don't know God. And so Paul, doing a very wise thing, a Socratic method, if he starts asking questions, do you know about the Holy Spirit? Were you baptized into the Holy Spirit? Okay? And look at their response. We, do, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. So that tells me what? Do they know Jesus Christ in salvation, in regeneration? Answer, no. But they're called disciples. 
Who are these individuals? These are people who go to church but don't have regenerative work in their life, all right? This is what I call bad theology. Now, please know this. In every church, you're going to have a time period, you're going to have an aspect of life where there's going to be bad theology, and you're going to have to be the one who's going to say that's not according to the Scripture. One of the greatest phrases that Billy Graham used to say and says continually as he preached for f- over 50 years is, the Bible says, the Bible says. The Bi- I used to watch him on interviews and his response often to questions by, the Bible says, the Bible says. You know what he was saying? It doesn't matter what Billy Graham says and the interviewer wants to know what he thinks. He says, the Bible says, and that's what, we need to be people like that. We need to say, the Bible says this. Now, does the Bible tell us everything that we want to know? No. And can we understand everything clearly in the Bible? No. We have to admit that. But those things that are clear, that we hold to, that are the essentials we will not walk away from. And hopefully, hopefully we are, have of the same stature of individuals who are now being asked over in Iraq and Afghanistan and other places like that, do you believe in Jesus? And the person who's asking as AK-47 And you know that if you say yes, and I will not recant, you know this is the last day that you'll be on earth. May we have that same statement, okay? But I want you to know that there are going to be messes in life that deal with bad theology. Remember at this time, just a little background, remember at this time there's no New Testament. So when Paul comes to Ephesus, there is the the whole New Testament, the 27 books that are in your Bible were not written. It's just right now about this time that they're starting to write, that James is writing his book, okay? This is around 52 AD. So this is about 30 years after, excuse me, 20 years after Jesus died. So there's no New Testament to get all of the doctrine. And Paul is pumping out all kinds of new theology. Never heard before, he's pumping it out. They didn't know about the salvation that is in Jesus Christ because he hadn't come. They simply trusted and had faith in God. Now Jesus Christ has come and Paul is starting to teach in the book of Romans all of the theology that you and I uh, know and ought to love. Now let me me get your hearts here, all right? When I say the word theology, what's the the feeling that goes on in your heart or in your head? What happens? What, what, What... What's the flavor that's going on inside when I say theology? I, I, this is what I'm getting from your faith. Yeah, yeah, I don't, you don't go there. Brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters, God wrote theology not just so the pastors can understand it, so his people could. You know what theology means? You know what the, the word theology means? Study of God. Brothers and sisters, my goal for you, I don't know how long I'm going to be pastor here, my goal for you is that when I'm done teaching here, every single one of you are theologians. Why? Because that's God's will for you. He wants you to have a great study. It's called the queen of sciences. Theology is the queen of science. And that means you and I have to be individuals that say, I want to study who God is. Now all of the particulars and all of the different doctrines, they're important for you to know. Anybody in here say, could say this, that a Catholic and a Christian believe the exact same thing? Or a Catholic and a Protestant believe this exact same thing? Do you believe that? No. They believe about 80% alike, but that 20%, what, what doctrine do the Catholics do not get? Pardon? Part of it? Okay, it's works, and that deals with what what, would, what doctrine would we say? Starts with a J, ends with an N, and has an N in the middle of it. Justification. Justification, all right? Justification. If I were to ask you, Earl, if I were to come to you and say, brother, let's go out and have a cup of coffee, I'm going to ask you and find out if you understand about what justification is. You know that's coming on Tuesday. What are you doing Monday? Studying. You're studying, all right? And what am I doing? Me too, all right? Is it important? For, is it important for him to understand justification? Yes, it is. Why? His entire life with Christ is based upon that doctrine. And if I could ask you this morning, do you understand? Can you, can you articulate to me what justification is? Can you articulate to me what sanctification is? 
So, well, I'll let the pastor do that. No, don't do that. Well, he, that's, that's what we pay him for. No. This isn't my book alone. It's your book. My dad, I, one of the things that my dad that I was really thankful for when I was growing up, my dad would sit down because he was interested in theology and he would sit down and start talking to me about theology. Now he would do it kind of brutal. He would ask me a leading question that would lead me to say yes as a kid and then he would just berate me because I was wrong. All right, that's dad's way of, he's in heaven now and he's learning on his own, okay, up there, all right. But he would, he would say, uh, son, do you have to have works for the, uh, salvation? Um, no. Really? Yes. <laughs> Which is it? Yes. You're wrong. Why'd you change? Right? But I saw and sensed in his heart a th- the love for theology. The problem that we have in these verses right here is you had people thinking that all they needed to do was repent. They didn't need to believe in Jesus Christ. All they needed to do was repent. That's wrong theology. And, and parents, you have to know the theology to be able to explain it. That's a mess. And so what Paul does here is he teaches them, they get rebaptized. And Luke shares with the world of the other age, you've got to have good theology. And I, and I, I want you to know this uh, theology, and you write this down if you would in your notes, theology, or should I say, good theology is the backbone of a healthy Christian life. Every problem and mess you have deals with theology. every mess. So if you come in and say, Pastor, I'd like to talk with you. I got some messes in my life I want to talk. I am going to sit down and my goal is to find out where you are errant in your theology and change it to the biblical theology. Does that make sense? That's all that I do in counseling. That's all I do. When I deal with marital issues, when I deal with, with personal issues, when I, whatever issue I deal with in, in, in uh, counseling, it's a theological issue. Because where where, where we get messed up in my personal life right now, I have wrong theology or I'm living by wrong theology. Get that? I don't necessarily know where it's at. That's why I'm studying the book. See? So if you want to solve problems, just don't, just don't you know, try to slap, a, do these four things and all fixed. It's a, it's a difference of theology. You've got to think through that, okay? Um, when I was a, a youth pastor years ago, I really sought to, taught, uh, to teach the teenagers about being theologians. I told their parents when I came. I remember having a, my first, and I, I don't know if it was my only, but it was at least my first um, a parent, uh, youth pastor parent deal. You know, that's where they size you up and you're trembling, all right? And I just basically told them, I said, I, I want you to know one thing, I'm gonna teach your kids how to be theologians. And I had a man stand up and say, that is impossible. And I looked at him, I said, you know, m- my high school kids are learning calculus My daughter is learning calculus. That is so far above the top of this head, all right? But I know one thing. If she can learn that and the the teenagers that I knew could learn calculus, they could learn theology because I could understand theology. See what I'm saying? The difference is desire. And after five years of being a, a, a youth pastor, that same man came back to me and said, well, you know what? You accomplished it. And what did we do? You ask any of the kids that were in the youth group, it was this. We would, we would talk about theology all the time. We'd be on the, on the way in the, uh, to the place, we would talk theology, and then we'd have fun afterwards. And that's, by the way, Brandon, that's a great way. Talk theology and then go have fun. All right, and that, that's the way to do it. If you want to be a good youth pastor, real simple, love kids, teach them theology, and have fun. That's it. That's all you got to know. Forget going to college for that, all right? That's all you need to know. I'll just tell you that right now, all right? <laughs> Love theology, love, save the money, Mar- Mariana, just, you don't have to go, you got it, those three things, all right, love, love teenagers, love kids, teach them theology, and have fun, it's a great way to live, I did it for five years, it was fantastic, okay, but get a, get a, get a youth pastor that likes to have fun, because some youth pastors don't know how to have fun, I, boy, that's the truth, I could tell you a story about that, we're going on, all right, the goal is, the goal is, to teach your kids, to teach your family, to teach people that are around you right theology, all right? Second thing, let's go there, all right? Now what happens in verse eight to 10, we have another mess happening, and I call it the mess of a hard heart. The mess of a hard heart. 
I really want to, I really want to touch your hearts on this one, on this one, all right? Because listen to me carefully. Both unsaved and Christian can have hard hearts. Um, a hard heart is the result, and this is important for you to write down, a hard heart is the result of choosing sin or self over the Savior. A hard heart is the result of choosing sin or self over the Savior. And you and I flow in and out of our hard heart. And being in the ministry now for 25 years, I know where hard hearts are. They are individuals who are being influenced by sin. Now, now let me just pause this, and, and the Lord really brought this home to me last night again. Parents, be careful what your kids watch on television. Okay? Um, and I say this, continually being reminded of this. And I'm not saying that what they're watching is wrong. Now, now hold on to this, and I'm going to be personal here. Hold, I'm not saying that what they're watching is wrong or it's sinful, but it has an effect in the life. All right? Now, this is going to be real personal. I have three children who are in places of great danger in their job. And they are going to see stuff, I already know. They've already seen stuff. That by virtue of what it is, it will harden the heart. It has to. Anybody that's been in the military will tell you when you get into a fight scene or you get into a battle, you get something like this, you got to go through it. That's the only thing you're thinking. Get through this alive. In order to do that, the stuff you see, it hardens the heart. It, it attacks the sensitivity of the soul. I have counseled scores of military guys and the stuff that they in my office, weep out of themselves that they have seen. In order to make it, they have to harden the heart. Remember when David, what did God say? David said, I want to build the temple. What did, what did God say to him? Can't do it. Why? You're a man of bloodshed. Wait a second, God. You're the one that made me the soldier. Get that. But it has an effect. And I say that in this way. Every single one of us walk through life. And as we walk through life, it affects us and it affects our hearts. Okay? I can take a military guy and I put him in that situation out of necessity. He has to fight the battle in order to get through it. If you want to talk to World War II vets, Vietnam vets, any kind of vet you want to talk to, in order to get through it, they have to steal that heart. And that was one of the things in reading about the Second World War. These 18-year-old, 17-year-old guys joined up right after Pearl Harbor. And in three months, they were over in Okinawa and other places like that. Okinawa later. But they were over in the Asian market <coughs> excuse me, the theater over there. And they were fighting and they were taking over islands and they were guys that they had known for three months and that they were friends and buddies and they're in a firefight and now he is gone. They have to deal with that, but not at that time because they're in the firefight and they have to go on. And you watch them sit in, your, in the chairs in your office and weep out. Why? Why did I live? And they go. What has to happen? The heart has to become hard. Now it's tender underneath that cat, but it has to be hum because of this stuff is so tough on them. Okay? Now this is what I'm saying. I've, I gave that illustration for this purpose. You don't have to do it voluntarily. I'm not talking about the military. When I turn on the television, I can voluntarily harden my heart. Because Why? Hard hearts are the result of the contact with sin. I don't care where. People that live in, in, in worlds of grave sin, their heart becomes hard because of that. We, have a, we do this in America. It's part of our theology. We don't let kids see on television what adults see. We have the rating system, right? G, PG, R, and goes on from there, all right? We don't, why do we say, why are we, why? Because we're saying we want the kids to be tender right? We don't want to see that. What are we saying? We are saying exactly what's coming out of my mouth. We're saying that that stuff hardens the heart and we want the kids to remain innocent. Does it make sense? So don't 
let your heart become hardened voluntarily. You may have to be a policeman. You may have to be a, a military guy. You may have to see some of this stuff that's just part of our society. That may be part of God's call in your life. But I don't have to then add to that, or I don't have to then live my life and say, you know what, I don't have to turn this on on the television, but I'm going to, and it's going to have an effect in my life. Make sense? And this, I've told you this before. It happened last night. I have a rule in my family, and, and everybody in my family knows that. You know, if you're going to use the name of God, okay, if you're going to use the name of Jesus, we got a problem in the movie. And I have a three strikes and you're out. And so it happens, and even our little, our little girls now, when I'm watching something and, and something comes up, and they know that there's a three-strike rule there. And so something trans, transpires, and some guy l- lets off with Jesus Christ or something, misuses God's name. I'm not letting the little girls see anything like that, okay? <laughs> I don't want you to just, oh, wow, no. Um, but if, if I'm in a movie and I'm watching that it hap- and it happened, first, that's one, and that's two. What, what, what am I doing that for? Do you think that that has any effect on God? You think God's up there going, God knows what the DVD says on it when it's not even running, right? I mean, God is God. Who's it affecting? Me. And I don't want to be in a place where it doesn't matter to me that Jesus Christ's name is misused. They don't have a clue. They can call God. They don't know who they're talking about. But the moment you say Jesus Christ, now you've made it personal, see? So we have to be people to say, you know what, no, I, I don't want to get hard like that. I don't want to see stuff on television that, yeah, everybody says it's fine to see. I don't want to harden my heart that way. Get what I'm saying? Does this make sense? So you have to deal with this world wherever God has placed you. But I, I, I simply wanted to say on the second point, there's a mess of having hard hearts, and that's because we're allowing for ourselves to be in contact with sin over the Savior. I want it to bother me. I want to get ticked off. I want to get mad when somebody uses my my Savior's name in vain, right? And if I am going to see it in a movie and there's some jerks out there, and Paul is coming out, okay, some weirdos that don't, they can't act unless they use that name in that way. I, I don't mean to, there are, there are guys that have a, a, have a problem with who Jesus is and it comes out of their acting. Well, I, want, I don't want to just, well, it's okay. Let's just say that. Let's say that. I don't want to do that. You know why? Because then I'm hardened to the one whom I love. Right? I would never allow for people to talk bad about my wife and kids. But if I was around a guy who all day long in work, all he did is talk bad about my wife and kids, what would, what would have to happen to me for me to stay there at work? I'd have to harden myself to what he's saying, saying it doesn't matter, right? Do you get what I mean? I don't want to do that. This is my Lord and Savior, all right? It bothers me that these people say it. Now, if I'm out and about in Walmart, you know, if Jim goes to, now Jim's not going to go to Walmart with me, but if I, if I go to Walmart and this person next to me starts using the Lord's, hey, you want to, listen, dude, come on, I'm all of me, right? You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to fight the guy, all right? Because we're out in public and he can do what he wants. But I don't have to turn on the television, Do you get what I'm saying? That's what I'm trying to get at. Where I have the right to say yes or no to something and it involves with this person saying something about someone I love and it may be I watched a movie until it was six minutes to the end and the last six minutes was when it was really going to conclude and the guy says it the third time. Now I'm really ticked. All right? Do you get what I'm trying to say? But I got to, do I find, by the way, in Acts chapter 24, 3, it says three strikes and you're out if you use the Lord's name in vain. No, it doesn't say that, okay? That's just my way of saying it matters to me that you don't say stuff about my, my Lord. Does that make sense? Do you get that? Okay. Don't let your heart get hard. Keep it soft. That's the one thing that my father says. Growing up, the number one thing that he said over and over and over again to me is, son, don't lose your tender heart. Don't lose your tender heart. Don't lose your tender heart. He never told me how. He just said, don't lose your tender heart. And I'll tell you how to not lose a tender heart. God has a way. And the way of doing that is to take you through trials and difficulties. Alan, when Sylvia is really hurting physically because of the pain in her body, I've watched you. 
What does that do to your heart and your tear ducts? I've watched it. Because there's not a thing he can do. Now who's, who has allowed for Sylvie to have chronic illness? God, if it was up to me, what? It'd be over. If it was up to Alan, Sylvia, I'll be right? God says, no, I'm allowing this. But what does that do to Alan's heart? It cuts it like a knife because there's not a thing you can do. And us guys are what? What do we, what do we want to do? We're going to fix this, all right? We're going to fix this. Can't fix it. God can fix it. But what does it do? I watch tenderness come. That's what God does. So all of the trials and the struggles that you're going on in your life right now, they're for tenderness of heart. Keep your heart tender. Do not involve yourself vo uh, voluntarily with things that are going to harden your heart, whatever it may be. Does it make sense now? Okay. That's from that passage of Scripture. What happened is that, that Paul uh, spoke the Word of God and they became hardened. They said, and Paul, what did Paul do? He separated himself from us. See, get that. It's a hardened situation, separate yourself from Okay, number three, number three. The mess of the supernatural. Verses 11 to 20, we read mess of the supernatural. Now, what do you mean by that, Will? Uh, let me ask you a question. Who's in charge of the supernatural? God. There's a mess with the supernatural. This is not, we're not putting, a, um, uh, talking about God. We're talking about the act of God. Whenever God, in his glory, touches mundane life and brings in the supernatural, there's a mess. Say so what I mean. Well, what was happening here? Paul was living his life and people were taking handkerchiefs that had touched Paul's body, right? Ap aprons. And they would take it to somebody who was sick, my sister, and guess what happened? It's healed, okay? See, that, that becomes a problem? Yeah, it becomes a problem. Why? Because what if I take that apron and I bring it over to Brenda? It doesn't heal her. Is that her problem now? What's the problem? Brenda, what are you thinking? What? I, I'm too sinful. Why, why did it work on her and it didn't work on me? And does God work miracles in some people's lives and not in others? Yes. See what I'm saying? Whenever, when, as long as it's natural life and as long as it's natural law, we're good because it affects everybody, right? What does supernatural mean? Doesn't accept everybody. I mean, it's not affecting everybody, right? Not everybody got healed. Do you get what I'm saying? So there's a mess that comes with the supernatural. And I want you to be very clear with this. I believe that miracles happen. I just want you to know that. I believe miracles happen. In fact, I will tell you, I have seen them with these two eyes. I have watched. Now, we want to be very clear this morning. In this circumstance, you had, you had supernatural stuff going on. You had exorcisms going on and all of that stuff. And I can't get into the entire nature of that, but I will say this. God still works in, a ma in ma miraculous ways in our lives. A miracle, get this, is something that is above the bounds of natural law. If natural law can do it, it wasn't a miracle. A miracle is something like changing the water into wine. Natural, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. You, I don't care what you do. Natural law is not going to make water, strictly water, going into wine. Make sense? What it had to happen? God, supernatural, right, comes in. You get what I'm saying? So when a person comes and, and they, they say, I'm sick, I go to the doctor, and the person has got, uh, let's say, let's say the person's got cancer, but we've got this remedy, and so we're going to give them medicine, and we're going to get them chemo, and we're going to do all of that stuff, okay? All of that stuff is within the realms of natural law, Right? A miracle is when God comes in and the doctor basically says, there's nothing else you can do. I, I, I told you about my friend Catherine, who's up in Ohio, who is dying of cancer. Basically, the doctor said, you're going to be gone by January. There's nothing more they can do. Now, they're doing all kinds of stuff to help her make her feel better. There's nothing more. They just... But that same statement was made to her seven years ago. She had level four cancer. The church prayed over her, anointed her with oil, went to the doctor, and the doctor said, I don't know what to tell you. We call it an act of God. 
because there's no, here's your x-ray, you got cancer, here's your x-ray, you don't got cancer. I don't know what to tell you. And she comes back to church and we can say, we can tell you what happened. You come on in, I have coffee with me. All right, I'll tell you what, that's an act of God. That's a miracle, get that? So we live in the providential world. Miracles are unusual. Miracles are by God's design. I do not have control over a miracle, right? God does. So I can pray for a miracle to happen that God would heal a person. And God could answer that person and not another person. But see, if I've got a sickness, usually, if you give me medicine, providentially, that medicine can heal me, and it heals the next person too, right? If a person has gotten some type of a, um, an illness or a disease, smallpox or something like that, and I give him certain medicine, it heals this person, right? Does it heal the next person? Yeah. Heal the next person, right? Yeah. See it all along the way. But you can't do that with level four cancer. You know what I'm saying? That's a miracle. And wherever miracles happen, they create a mess. They verify the truth, and this is what happened in the book of Acts. Miracles were used to verify the fact that what the apostles were saying were true. And that's what happens here. So you have these, these sons of Sceva, and these guys, they wanna, they wanna use the power of something else that they don't understand and know, and the demon just comes and just nails them, all right? But I want you to see, because this is important, this is, this is on, look what happens in verse 17. Now, let me take you back. These seven guys go into this one man and say, demon, leave. Demon says, Jesus I know, Paul I know, who are you? And just torches him, right? Would you, who's in charge? I mean, who's working that thing out? It's the demon, right? You would think it would be a negative thing, right? Here I'm trying to cast this person out in the name of Jesus and, and, and the demon won, right? But look what happened in verse 17. This became known to all the Jews and Greeks dwelling in Ephesus and fear upon all and the name of the Lord Jesus was mad. How did that happen? I thought it was the demon won and the seven sons of CEO zero, right? But what happened? And this is, this is what I want you to get. What God did is God is sovereign over us. I love that song. God is sovereign over us. And he turned it to where it glorified him. Because you know what happened? What did the people realize was the, the fraud of these seven sons of Sceva and realize when the demon said, Jesus I know and Paul I know. And that says in verse seven, fear fell upon everyone. God is sovereign over us. This became known and fear fell upon it. Same thing that happened in Acts chapter two. Years ago, uh, something like this uh, occurred, and, uh, and I want to uh, relate that. Look at verse um, uh, 20. And so the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. The word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed. Years ago, um, uh, 14 years ago, around that time, Marie and I went to a youth conference. Um, there was 2,500 teenagers there. And God was working in the midst of, and because of the Spirit of God's work, they put out um, eight different big 50-gallon drum barrels. It's an application of the, of the sermon. And the guy had said, you teenagers have in your possession music, videos, movies, contraband that's destroying your life and it's in your room right now, back in the dorm. And you need to get rid of it. And I watched them close the meeting. Teenagers went back to the rooms and literally brought out thousands of dollars worth of stuff. DVDs and CDs and all kinds of paraphernalia. And they threw it into, the, into these barrels and they burned them all. And the effect of that in the lives of those teenagers was enormous. Why? Because they had done exactly what happened in verse 19. And many of those who had practiced magic brought their books together and burned them in the sight of all. And they counted up the value of them at 50,000 uh, pieces of silver around as close as we can get. And we can't really, really know the, the, the equal sign there, but it was over $10,000 at least. 
And I watched that very same thing happen. The guy preached on this message and I watched these teenagers throw out. And you know what I saw? I, I saw hardened hearts become soft. Why? Because they were getting sin out of their life. I believe, I literally believe that when you allow something from the evil one into your life, there is a pathway that the devil can get to you. And some of you guys and or gals have stuff on your, on your laptop or have on your iPad or your iPod that is evil. There are songs that are dedicated to the evil one. And we got Christians who are listening to them. I've watched it. I've seen it. You go in and you hear people play the, this music that just calls basically Jesus all kinds of names. Heard it this last week. And calls upon the evil one to come and have victory over him. That is just not bad. You open the door to the evil one. He'll come right in. And I'm asking you teenagers and I'm asking you adults, if there's stuff in your life right now that the Holy Spirit is saying that needs to get out of your life. And I'll tell you this, parents, you need to go home and start looking at your movies. This happened to me a, a, little, a little while ago. I just was convicted by the Holy Spirit that I'm allowing into my home movies that I would be ashamed if I sat and watched with the Lord, with the Lord Jesus next to me. Either they misused his name and we get real good at kind of fast forwarding so that we don't hear it, all right? Or there are scenes in there that I shouldn't be watching. What's it doing in my home? And so I started tossing. Uh, let me tell you guys, tell your wife before you do that or tell your kids because some, I didn't tell my kids, it started tossing stuff. And I mean, I'm dumping 15 vid videos and all this stuff just because I was convicted. And I, well, they, wh where, where, I can't find this anymore. Okay, all right. All I'm saying is don't allow for the evil one to have a presence in your home because you're giving him an open door. Get what I'm saying? And that's what happened here. These people said enough. We're giving this junk up. I saw those teenagers dump stuff into that and just lit it with kerosene and burned it all up. And you know what? They were... They were dancing. They were so happy. Why? They were free. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, whether they went back and bought it again or what, I don't deal with. All I'm saying is we need to go home. Husbands, I'm putting you on notice. Guys, you need to make sure that your house doesn't have junk that praises the evil one in your home. And you got to be careful what you listen on the radio. You got to be careful of what you see on television because you're going to watch a fine program and all of a sudden, a split second, boom, boom. Where did that come from? Okay, be careful what you allow. Because I believe that's an end the devil has in our homes as Christians. God wants our homes holy. So what you allow on your iPad and your iPod and your laptop and all of that stuff, that's between you and God, yeah. It's also between you, God, and the devil. Okay, you know what I'm saying? That's what happened in this passage right at Scripture. And they threw it all away. And look, what verse 19 comes before verse 20. And verse 20 says what? The, Lord, the word of the Lord grew mightily and prevailed, right? What preceded that? A giving up of junk. Got that? So get it out of your life. Get it out of your home. Throw it away. Anything that tempts you or gives an open door to the evil one, get it out of your life. Man, I, I was throwing away Stuff that we, that we thought it's a cute movie. It's not, yeah, I had that bad part, but yeah, it is a cute movie. You think God says, oh yeah, it's okay. It has that bad part. But no, that stuff's gonna have an effect. You're gonna throw away $10? Throw away $10. Okay, and this was said. Well, let's sell it on eBay. <laughs> no, it's, no, okay. If we're gonna throw it away because it's trash, it needs to be trashed, right? So guys, gals, clean the homes. Live out holy. Last thing and we're done. Number four, the mess of verses 21 to 41, idolatry. The mess of idolatry. And I could spend a whole sermon on this. Um, 
I, I don't have the time. But I want you to look at verse 25. Because it goes along with what we've just been saying. And he called them together. This is Demetrius. Demetrius is a silversmith. And you can read this starting in verse 21. What basically happens is that after two years, it hits the fan. It's an amazing thing. that. Uh, let me just take, take a few moments to, to read this portion a bit. Verse 24. Uh, there had been a great commotion about the way. In verse 24, a certain man by the name of Demetrius, a silversmith who had made silver shrines for Diana, or Diana, brought no small profit to the craftsmen, he called them together with workers of similar occupation and said, Men, you know, there it is, you know that we have great prosperity by this trade. How many unsaved, ungodly men who seek to destroy the Christian faith are getting paid by Christians who buy their junk? Moreover, you see and hear that not only in Ephesus but throughout almost all Asia, this Paul, I like how he says that, this, this Paul, he's not really well loved, has persuaded and turned away many people saying that they are not God, excuse me, that our, their idols, that they're not gods which are made with human hands. So not only is this trade of ours in danger of falling into disrepute, but the temple of the great goddess Diana may be uh, despised and her magnificence destroyed, whom all Asia and the world worship. And when they heard this, they were full of wrath and they cried out saying, Great is Diana in the, uh, of the Ephesians. And so the whole city was filled with confusion and rushed into the alt, into the theater with one accord having seized Gaius and uh, Aristarchus, uh, Macedonian, Paul's uh, traveling companions. And when Paul wanted to go into the people, the disciples wouldn't let him go. And some of the officials of Asia who were his friends sent out said, Don't come in here. Verse 32, some therefore cried one thing and others another. The assembly was confused and most of them didn't know why they were there. I love that. <laughs> we're here. Why are we here? We don't know, okay? This is just, the whole thing is a tumult. And so they draw out Alexander in verse 33 out of the multitude and the Jews putting him forward. Alexander, he quiets the crowd. He wants to make his defense. And when they found out he was a Jew and all with one voice cried out, great is Diana of the Ephesians. And when the city clerk came and quieted the crowd, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who does not know that this is the city of Ephesus? The Ephesians is, is a temple guardian of the great goddess Diana, which the image fell out of, of heaven from Zeus. Therefore, since these things cannot be denied, you ought to be quiet and do nothing. Rash. For you have brought these men in here, neither robbers or temples, or blasphemers of the goddess. Therefore, if Demetrius and his fellow craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are open, they can go to them. Verse 39, but if you have any other inquiry, it should be determined before a lawful assembly. Now get this, for we are in danger of being called into question. Those phrase right there, called in question for today's uproar. Let me just explain what that was. The Roman government had a zero tolerance with riotous uh, meetings. If it got riotous, they wouldn't ask questions. They would send the army. They would decimate the city and it would be over. That's the way it was. So that's what he's afraid of. He says, we can't explain why we're meeting. So you need to go home because if we're called into question about this, we could be dead. That's what basically he's saying. And when he has said these things, he dismissed the assembly. Last one, the mess of idolatry. Let me just say this. Idolatry is the core problem of every person, church, and circumstance. Idolatry is the core problem. Idolatry is what your problem is with messes. And when you, find, when you start dealing with your, listen carefully, when you start dealing with your mess, you're always gonna find an idol at the bottom of it. Okay? And I got idols in my life. All right? Very up front, I got idols in my life. And it's good theology that takes those idols out. But John Calvin said this, and it's true for you and me. Your heart is a factory of idols. We're old enough to where we've tossed idols out of our lives for years, right? What happens? We find more, right? There's not gonna be any idols in heaven. Amen? Amen? I mean, for my own soul, amen? Amen, no idols in heaven, they're gone. But right now we fight idols. And you'll find at the bottom of all of your messes is an idol of some kind. 
Something that, when you say, well, what is an idol? Write this passage down, Colossians 3, 5, and 6, you'll find the definition of idolship. Definition of idols in, in Colossians 3, 5. That's a great passage. Definition of idol is this, anything that matters more to you than God. And every time I sin, I'm in idolatry. Because I'm saying that sin is more important than God. Make sense? So what am I calling you here today for? Um, I'm calling you this, simply this, I've had, we've dealt with four things and I simply want to call you here this morning to this. I want to call you to deal with the messes in your life. That's all I want to ask. Just that commitment, that all, that all. I don't want to deal with the specific commitment, I just with that statement, God, here it is, God, I will deal with the messes that you bring into my life. I'm not going to run from them anymore. I'm not going to ignore them anymore. I'll deal with them. Whatever they are, whatever you allow in my life, I will deal with them. If it's another person, if it's my job, it's whatever you want, God, I will deal with That's the commitment I'm asking for you today. God, whatever is in my life that is a mess, if you will help me, I will deal with it. That's what I'm calling you for. Because that's what Christianity is about. And that's what ministry is about. Let's pray.